Welcome to the Intuitive Rising Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Brooks. This is a podcast that invites you to remember who you are, return to yourself, and rise into your highest and best soul self. Every week, I will be sharing inspiring conversations about topics that hold keys to your awakening. My mission as an international evidential psychic medium, Reiki practitioner, and intuitive mentor is to help you rise into who you were born to be. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Intuitive Rising podcast. So happy that you have joined me once again for another episode. I have a treat for you today. I have a special guest. Her name is Rebecca Hill, and she is a talented artist and a creative collaborator. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. We're so uh, happy to have you here. I feel like this is a long time coming, although we have only really kind of got to know each other in the last maybe like four or five months. Um, and that kind of has a story in itself. I uh, I feel like I don't know how I found you on Instagram, but I somehow found you on Instagram. And then I saw that you, um, you know, you're this amazing artist. And I saw this specific piece of art um, that was, uh, you know, it, on the cover of a journal because you uh, create things like journals and things like I that, do. right? You can tell us more about that in, in a moment. But I saw one that has a red fox on it and uh, friends of the podcast will definitely know that that is my totem animal. So I'll hold it up if you're watching on YouTube. This is the journal here with the red fox. And I started this back in the new year and it's kind of like my 2023 intuitive journal. I put card pulls and, and things like that. Uh, questions I have to ask the tarot, all that kind of stuff is what this journal is for me. And so that's kind of how I discovered discovered you and found you and then we made a connection and I think like maybe on the first or second day that we kind of connected on Instagram we had a very long like multiple hour back and forth conversation in the private, private messages yes and it, so many alignments it was yeah it was, <laughs> was kind of wild it was like one of those circumstances where you're like I don't know you but I know you and I definitely feel like the universe has connected us to you know, get together and all these synchronicities and connections that we have just kind of blew me out of the water. And I feel like we, we were quite, we're quite similar, like that we have some similarities also, um, just kind of being very multifaceted and multi-passionate yes. and wanting to dive in all the things and being creative in our own right. So, um, Tell us a little bit more about you. I love this term creative collaborator. I think that's amazing. Um, so have you kind of like always been into art? Have you always thought of yourself as an artist? Yes, I actually have ever since I was tiny. And I know this is the story of a lot of artists. Like, mm -hmm. I think you are born an artist, even though everybody is creative. Um, yes. It's not even an option. Like I wasn't technically good at art when I was little. You wouldn't, my paintings and drawings were nothing to write home about. In fact, my sister would make fun of them saying that uh, my uh, horses had human legs. So. <laughs> <laughs> but she was an artist too. So I grew up in her mm -hmm. shadow and we would have art competitions and she would always declare herself the winner. So I, I grew up in Scotland and then moved to England near Hadrian's Wall. And now I live in Nova Scotia, Canada. So mm -hmm. I like to bring into my art the connection between these three places, which are very special to me. Mm. I love So that. now I live here with my family, my, my husband and my four kids. And um, for the longest time, I was doing digital art, like websites and T-shirt designs. And it mm -hmm. took about 20 years for me to get the confidence to step into my, my art career and really lean into it. So it's been a process of unraveling and unlearning societal mm -hmm. expectations to become who I am. And I think a lot of people can resonate with that journey. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, especially those of us, you know, kind of stepping into the our own spirituality and what what it means to be tapped into um, our spirit, right? I think that regardless of what someone may be doing in their life or work or as a passion, we all kind of go through that period or most of us, especially on a spiritual awakening journey, where we um, kind of do that unraveling or that unlearning. And, and, and it's, it's interesting to me and it's not surprising at all that, you know, something that you found um, passion and peace and enjoyment out of when you were a child has turned out to be this thing that you still 
feel that way about because I often feel like you want to know like what you're here to do or part of the reason that you're here and your gifts, like what did you really enjoy as a child? Um, Cause there's, there's something there for you. So I, yeah, I, I love that that showed up for you as a child. I definitely that, and that's part of the, the journey with my art is listening mm-hmm. to listening to what my eight year old self would tell me and yeah. what she found exciting and interesting before the world told her that that was no good. That was not the way to be. And that was right. something wrong with that. So it's getting right. back and listening to her decisions, which has led to me having all kinds of interesting things with my journey, moving away from realistic pictures and mm. moving towards sparkles and purple and uh, spirit animals and all kinds of interesting subjects that I'm exploring. Yeah, I'm kind of in my in my mind, like one of my favorite genres of books, so I have two, it's like historical fiction, but the other one is magical realism. And that's kind of like, your art reminds me of magical realism. So it's like a real fox, right? Or a real woman, it looks like the piece of art behind you. Is that an original piece of yours? Um, yes, it's, yes. Um, it's actually a picture of one of my friends. I got her to pose in oh, the grass. how beautiful. <laughs> that was a fun so, day. That's beautiful. And, uh, yes. And it's sort of, it's like a goddess series, but it's not really, I don't, as soon as some, as soon as I declare I'm doing a series, then I immediately lose interest in doing that series. So I try yeah. and keep my direction <laughs> open with my artwork. Yeah. Yeah, but I could, you know, just in the sense I was saying that magical realism mm-hmm. because you know it's you can tell it's a it's a person there, it's a portrait of a woman, but yes. there's magical elements. Um, there so I is really love like that. some people have um, like I often find people come up to me and tell me that they end up staring into my art for like ten minutes at a time, just absorbed in it, which is They're fascinating to me. And they see different mm-hmm. things in it. For example, in that mm-hmm. picture, um, someone came up to me and told me that they thought they were spirit orbs around around the, oh. the girl. And I thought that was, and it, when I was drawing them, painting them, that wasn't the first thing that came to mind, but then it made complete sense. It made sense. Yeah. So. This leads in really beautifully to the next question that I, I was going to ask you. And I was kind of like learning to listen to your intuition, right? Mm-hmm. And I had asked you an example or a way in which you'd learn to trust that. Um, do you connect that with your art? Like if you're thinking about learning to connect to your intuition would it have been like in that unraveling and that unlearning of the conditioning around what you should do and like tapping into your artistry and your creativity again I think this has been this is again has been like a a lifelong learning journey for me Mm because I grew up in a a Catholic family but my father Mm -hmm. was my father even even though he's very Catholic was absolutely into the the spiritual um practices Mm -hmm. like, like he would um, divining he'd show us how to find water with divining rods and um wow. how to um all these just different practices and and so I sort of learned from him ways of listening to yourself uh-huh. and as I do it with my artwork it's more um it's like a surrender so I, I work with my art and I have oh it should look like this and I have to make it more realistic and I have to do this and when I find I do that then things stop working and it becomes flat and dead and uninteresting yes. mm-hmm. and I get frustrated and I could spend days reworking the same area until I remember hang on a second you know you got to remember to use your intuition and let go yes and when I do that things just start working better it's mm. like I sort of defocus my eyes and just let it go with the flow and just yeah. listen to what I feel nudged to create more areas I feel drawn to work on, which sometimes leads to unconventional ways of creating my art. For mm. example, if I'm blocking in color, like people might just block a flat area of color because that makes sense. That's logical. But I can't do that. I end up scrabbling around and making different textures and areas and just going with the flow. and. In the end, while I'm telling myself, like, that's not a way a proper artist would do it, it ends up being a far more richer and interesting piece. So it's become a really important part of my process. Oh, I love this. Just the surrender and just, you know, you might have a plan, but also surrendering to what comes in the moment. Yes. And the funny thing is, is I have to remind myself with every single piece, you would think (laughs) you would like, oh, just go with the flow every time. But you have to hit that, that, you know, that 
uncomfortable place that place where yes. you're just about to quit your entire career and go get a you know desk job <laughs> yeah I think that's important though to bring up as well like regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey or what you're doing with your life you know it's it's this is intentional like I think when you are um connecting to your intuition like yes it can become become a little bit more fluid and um, a little bit more on autopilot but more often than not especially when you're dealing with resistance of something um, it's an intentional act. It's a conscious act of, no, I'm going to surrender, you know, and you, you have to talk and tell mm -hmm. yourself that. I think that's an important thing for people to to know um, when they're on their journey, especially in the beginning, because sometimes we think like, oh, this is just supposed to be second nature now. Like I'm not supposed to slip. I'm not supposed to like yeah. have to remind myself. It's not the truth. I it's remind like myself all the time. <laughs> It's not like you learn it once and you've unlocked no. that level and you don't have to think about it anymore. You've got a, a badge for that and then you're done. No, it's like over and over. You have to remind over yourself. Over and over. Lifetime journey. Um, mm. But the resistance that you'll feel might lessen a little bit, mm. um, you know, because you've learned to trust. Okay, like mm. when I surrender, this magical thing happens and it feels so fulfilling and satisfying versus feeling kind of like stuck. I feel that with like writer's block, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, I think that you know that I'm like in the process, maybe you don't, I'm in the process of like writing a solo book that's been in the works for like 25 years and I am <laughs> finally going to do it. But I have to, my husband will be like, you should go down there and you should write. And I'm like, honey, I know you don't get this, but when I am not feeling like I'm, I'm in flow and it's time, mm -hmm. I can't, like I have to, it has to flow, it has, something has to turn on inside of me. So I can't just force myself to sit here and create. Um, you can, but it right. does, you don't it create doesn't... anything interesting. It's like you're going upstream right. and you're fighting against the current. That's... And if you and if you wait until you are in the flow, then you can create like a week's worth of work in a few hours. Absolutely. It's like it accelerates. It's like you're you're not wasting time, right? By, by waiting for the right moment, um, you're probably creating uh, it's like you're creating more in, in yes. less time. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's a, a mindset issue as well that we keep, when you get into the fear state, you go back into those societal ruts of that's like right. work hard, effort more. And, yeah. and, and that is the way to succeed. And yes, you have to take action, but if you are making yourself, then you, you are not allowing the creativity to flow through you and you're not allowing mm -hmm. the best answers to come from you. You're not allowing like, those interesting little paths that take you to something way more like absolutely maybe absolutely we'll, know, better <laughs> yeah and that's what we're collectively like we're collectively unlearning all of mm -hmm. that like hustle and fake it till you make it and force mm -hmm. and push and and we're all collectively swimming upstream mm -hmm. um and we have been for a long time and then we wonder why things don't feel fulfilling or why we're exhausted all the time, you know, yes. like, yeah, we're physically exhausted because we've got a lot going on, but there's a difference between like physical tired and soul tired. Yes. And I, I bet that you know what that feels like. It's just that <laughs> trust, that yeah. trust that you have to, that the trust in yourself and the trust that you're going to be supported if you allow yourself to wait until you feel called to do something because mm. you feel in your head, you might be saying, Oh, but I'm lazy. Oh, but like, mm. if I would, if, if I did, if I don't, then I'm not, I don't believing in myself, but sometimes just giving yourself that space, mm -hmm. you go so much further and faster, but it's yeah. hard to explain it to people who don't see, especially the people around you who don't necessarily believe in that approach of mm. leaning into when you feel call to do something as opposed to just grinding away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're definitely, I mean, this is a challenge with a lot of people, you know, especially people that are not in self self employed and would be working for someone else, you know, it's kind mm -hmm. of like, well, I feel this way, but my boss is like, deadline, deadline, do it. Now, right? I know it's difficult. But I feel like if you just allow yourself to have that space and grace with yourself, um, maybe if you can't do it at work, like do it in your own life where you have the freedom and the choice with whatever it is that you're working on or that interests you, um, that can really kind of satisfy the soul in the meantime, as your as your work catches up. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. even even with if you if you're working a job, and you're allowed some kind of flexibility over your time, tasks you mm -hmm. could still rearrange them so you're doing the tasks that require creativity when you're feeling up for it and doing the more monotonous tasks when you're feeling depleted 
It's interesting you're saying that too, because I've noticed like this collective kind of theme within some of my client readings lately about the importance of choice and how it is so important to us as souls to have choice. Um, and like, you know, choice in when we do this, a choice in when we create or surrendering rather than forcing. Um, and and one, one of the easiest ways I feel like to like tap in and really find confidence in your intuitive knowing and your intuition is to give yourself choice, Mm -hmm. right? And anyone can do that. It can be very simple and kind of, you know, with the minutia of life, like, um, do I want to eat toast this morning or do I want cereal, right? Do I want coffee or do I want tea? Like all of these little things that we don't ever ask ourselves because we're on autopilot, Mm -hmm. but taking a moment to ask yourself a question doesn't matter what it is. Do I want to wear this shirt or this shirt or drive this way or drive this way? It do, It's like your soul is like, oh my God, she's listening. She's listening. She actually cares what I want, right? And I feel yeah. like I've done that in my life and I've gui- guided other people to do that. And the feedback is I feel more confident. It's like I, I there's a part of me that's kind of sp- sparked like something is reawakening within me because I'm listening and then through listening I'm able to trust and find more confidence in the thing so I just kind of you know what I what I would like to say in this moment is for our listeners like let life surprise you sometimes and I actually have a a good example it's not related to art but with um where I surrendered a situation I had, it was like earlier last year, I had these plans that it worked out like a a vacation at an Airbnb and I wanted my Mm -hmm. children to come with me and I wanted, I had to take my aunt and uncle with me and nothing was lining up. Nothing was lining up at all. Like my my son had work and they weren't going to let him out of work and, um, Mm -hmm. and my aunt had to come with me instead of her daughter and it was just, nothing was working. And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to surrender this and see what happens because there's nothing I can do. Yeah. And then not within a, a day or so later, I had an idea to just call the Airbnb and and ask if I could change the booking from one day later. And then all of a sudden, everything just fell into place and everything that I wanted to do was possible mm-hmm. that seemed impossible before. So it just, I sometimes think back to this example whenever I'm feeling, um, doubting whether surrendering will work and I remember like you know what you let go and this important thing happened you didn't have to lose out on $1,200 on the Airbnb and cancel and you know you were able to you know take your elderly aunt with you and everything worked out well so it's like sometimes you need these anchors of proof that letting go and surrendering works yeah yeah I love that that's a really great real life example that I'm sure many people can relate to um yeah, I, I'm thinking of so many times that something similar has happened to me, right? And sometimes it's just like something better may come. You know, if, if something, if you're feeling like you're hitting your head against a wall, it's like maybe just, it's not always about giving up. This is something that I've learned mm-hmm. from my own connection to spirit because there was a time where I thought like this work, I think I've shared with you and I know I've shared on this podcast before that um, there was a time that I was afraid of being seen, right? So I didn't want to do anything by video or in person. I wanted to do everything behind the scenes because I was very comfortable with a pen or a paper, right? Or or a type, uh, a keyboard, right? Um, and for me, it was, I almost thought like, does this just mean that I shouldn't be this or do this mm-hmm. anymore? It's not always that black and white. Like sometimes it's just like about tweaking or adjustment. Um And so once I had, you know, some time to kind of get that clarity, reach that place of clarity, it was just like, this is just about tweaking something that I'm doing. And same for you, just maybe stop trying to force this one thing and just see what happens. And it was just a day, you know, like, yeah, yeah, it can be that simple. It was one small change that I know just came to me. So I've downloaded that, that idea to... Yeah. Because normally you don't get to change your bookings, but it right. just, and it worked out perfectly for the Airbnb people as well because they they would they preferred a day between bookings for the cleaner, so they were happy as well. They were happy. I some I sometimes wonder, like I I mean I feel like this is truth for me, but like I wonder if anybody else thinks this way. Like when you have like say like that download, right? Like or you have an idea about something or just something's not working out. Like I see this sometimes with my clients. Like say something happens at home or I come down with the flu and the morning I you know I'm supposed to be working with a client that day and I reach out and I'm like I'm so sorry. 
um, I'm not feeling well. And, you know, I move through the resistance of doing that because I don't want to disappoint someone. And mm-hmm. as someone who's self-employed, right? Like you don't, you don't want to turn your clients away, mm-hmm. but I will tell you like 99% of the time I'll get a response. Oh my God, today wasn't good for me anymore. And I didn't know what to do. And I'm so, I'm actually so glad that you reached out. It worked out for me too. So that helps me trust like, okay, if this is like not working for me, maybe it's better for the cult, like everyone involved. Um, yes. It, and sometimes mm-hmm. it works out that way. It does. And lately I've been finding, you talked about having fears as an, as an entrepreneur. Yes. That. I will get little nudges or just impulses to reach out to a person and it doesn't seem to make sense. It's a little scary. Um, Uh And, but I will do it. I will email someone and with an idea and you would be surprised how many people will say yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. to things that you wouldn't expect that other people will say, well, that's a bit cheeky to ask them that. But if you get that nudge, if you get that message to just say, Oh, email that person or just reach out and say this and you do it like, so many opportunities have come to me through just Mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will just say yes to these opportunities, even though I've never done them before and they terrify me, I just book them and just trust that if that was what I was supposed to be doing, then I will find the courage somewhere (laughs) to go through with it. Yeah. Or this is like an aligned move or this is going to connect me with someone or something or bring me closer to a goal or a dream. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, a a true example of following the breadcrumbs. That's a great example. So we're kind of talking a little bit of like this concept of downloading. Um, I'll take it a step further with channeling. Okay. So Mm -hmm. I am someone who believes that everyone channels, right? Everyone like might have, an idea about something. I'll use a really, I'll go use an example. That's like just at the tip of my tongue with a client. So I did an event on Friday night where there was, I was with another medium. We had eight p- attendees and everybody received a reading. And um, I brought through someone's grandmother. She brought through a lot of stuff. Okay. And then that person messaged me yesterday and they're like, so my father does not know that I received, like I had a reading does not know that my grandmother came through. But some of the things that you brought through about her and that she was speaking about, all of a sudden he's talking about, like, why is he talking about her? And why is he bringing up the specific thing that you brought up in a reading? And to me, I'm like, well, that's an example of channeling. He's feeling her energy Mm -hmm. or, you know, she's placing something in his awareness and he's just not aware Mm -hmm. that that's what's happening. And that's why I feel like mediumship or channeling is something, yes, there's people to varying degrees of sensitivities. There's a spectrum, just like Mm -hmm. our creativity, singing, all of the things. Some people are just kind of naturally inclined. However, everyone can connect to spirit Mm -hmm. in their own way. Do you, you, you agree too. Do you, do you feel like when you are in creator mode that you might be channeling at times? Um, I definitely have been told this in readings that, that I okay. do that, that mm-hmm. and it's, it's kind of interesting sometimes when I'm doing a pet portrait and often the pet has passed away. So it's a memorial mm. por- portrait. I sometimes talk to the, <laughs> talk to the animal. And it sounds yeah. crazy, but it's no, like, it doesn't. I feel like, because when I end up giving the art to the person, they often cry. They often just, you know, they, they say, you've really captured them. Yeah. And so. I feel like by doing that, I'm adding, I'm making it more than the sum of its parts. I'm adding a little bit of their energy into the picture. Absolutely. And then sometimes I actively, um, I say actively channel, but I, yeah. while I'm painting and I'm getting struggling with, with something technical, I'll, always, yeah. I'll say, oh, I'll try and picture someone like John Singer Sargent or even like Bob Ross or someone saying like, what should I do in this situation? And just picture that they're sort of guiding my brush. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I can just picture Bob Ross like, yeah, yeah, they would do this, like just kind of hovering over you. I love that. <laughs> I think that is absolute truth because I, I do believe that we're all connected to the collective consciousness, the stream mm-hmm. of consciousness. And I believe that's why you'll see like themes in the collective. Mm-hmm. Like, um, for instance, the other day I recorded a, another podcast on my my podcast soul rising that I record with my friend Aaron and we were talking about nostalgia and how we're seeing a lot of nostalgia with people and just reboots and things coming Mm -hmm. back and like why is that you know like what's that trying to tell us 
And then a couple of people messaged me and they're like, oh my God, I just recorded a podcast about nostalgia or I'm, I've been thinking about that, right? And I think that's an example of how there's something kind of moving through the collective, like pay attention to this. I think yes. that's why like things like um, daily tarot polls and things like so many people can relate to the same message in their own way because collectively we're learning something. I've definitely noticed that like I'll post mm -hmm. about something and then I'll, I'll maybe listen to one of your podcasts and it's there. what I've posted about is exactly what you were talking about in, in your podcast or, yeah. or some of the other people that I follow, they, they have posted the same message and yeah. I hadn't seen that post and I'm like, okay, this must be like a yeah. universal message. Mm -hmm. I see it all the time. And the more I become aware of that, I'm like, it just, and I know like some people will be like, oh, the algorithm. I'm like, okay, but like, why are we all talking about the same thing on the same day? Like, how can you explain that? You know, especially when um, there's like influences who schedule their posts. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. So let's talk about moving through fears and doubts as an entrepreneur. <laughs> so we're both entrepreneurs. Have you yes. always been an entrepreneur? Ever since um, I had my first child, before yeah. that I worked full time in, in an art department. Um, and when I had, went on maternity leave with my first child, I never went back to work full time since. I so I, I, I started you. freelancing for the same company and then freelancing from other companies and built my business that way. So you've been in it for a long time. I didn't yes. know that. I think our, our oldest children are of similar age, maybe the same age. I also mm -hmm. was working full time. And then when I went on maternity leave, did not go back. Yeah. Um, I went back like to different jobs here and there on a part time mm -hmm. basis, but not for long, um, but never back to a full time gig after that. Something kind of really switched and, and changed in me at that time. So yeah, you've been I doing think, that. I think, for, sorry. I think it was at that um, freedom that we talk about that. Uh, yeah. The once choice. you've got used to like living a freelance life and it's funny how mm. I did have a business but I'd never considered freelancing as a business but it, it sort of is because you have to have a business in Canada in order to freelance mm -hmm. but that sort of freedom where I get to pick my hours I get to pick my jobs I get to pick when I do them and like what we said earlier being able to work on them when you feel motivated to work on them and be able to rest when you need to rest and so to go back to a rigid nine to five it just did not sit well with me at all it would now that we've had a taste of it and been is successful in our own right at what we're doing, um, personally satisfied with what we're doing, I would imagine it would feel a bit like clipping our wings if we had to go back to like a nine to five, uh, you know, a red tape, lots of office -y dynamics. I'd be like, no, I can't. You can't unknow it. <laughs> I can't. I can't go back. No, you can't unknow it. You can't go back I see that in a in a lot of things in life it's like you just can't go back um, I'd even rather take that. less than uh, less uh absolutely uh, money than go back to that kind of rigid um rat race right like what's more important having more money or having more time like I know obviously we need money in this world and I'm not going to be na naive enough to say that we don't but our our kind of um, needs and wants and desires may change a little bit. And I see that a lot with people, especially as they tend to get, like, as they get a little bit older where they're like, do I want to work less for this? Or do I want to work more for this? You know, and it just, some things become less desirable. It's like our priorities change a little bit. Um, so working through fears and debts. Now we have kind of bonded over how we have busy brains Mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, both of us. I think this is a often, not always, but often a creative person thing um, yes. where we're kind of tapped in and we're like all these like shiny possibilities around. Has that added to any of your fears or insecurities of being an entrepreneur at time? Like, I and I'll tell you why I ask this, because for me, it has. Mm -hmm. I've had to work through. OK, so like I have a diagnosis of attention deficit uh, mm -hmm. disorder. Okay. This came as a grown woman when my middle son was diagnosed when he was about 13. So I'm like in my late thirties at this point mm -hmm. and he was diagnosed and I was sitting there going, my husband and I were looking at each other and he's like, Holy crap, that's you. And I was like, Oh my God, um, <laughs> this is me. Um, this was like just the most obvious case of ADHD ever. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've always felt very scattered. Like I can't keep a routine. Like I can't depend on myself because I don't stick through with things. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there was a lot of 
BS that I had to move through, right? And, and a lot and, of shame. And, like, there's, there's a lot a- of shame mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. And as women too, I think, because ADHD can manifest or show up a little bit differently with women sometimes. So for me, speaking from personal experience, for me, it was very internally based. So I'm not necessarily like hyper-physically, but very much inner. And so we keep that inside and we don't talk about it. And we don't tell people, hey, I'm drowning over here. I can't manage like these like basic like stay at home mm-hmm. mom tasks that we're all supposed to be doing. And I'm mm-hmm. friggin' drowning and we just feel shame. Um, for me, it took a lot of mindset work of like shifting things like, hey, rather than scattered, I'm multi-passionate, you yes. know, um, rebranding it. <laughs> rebrand- that's helped me so much. Mm-hmm. But there was a lot of fears and doubts of am I going to be able to stick with this? Um, am I going to be able to meet someone's expectations? Mm-hmm. Am I going to be able to stick to a schedule and a routine, right? Because I never thought I could be someone who could keep like myself kind of on a routine. I thought, okay, I'm somebody that needs to work for someone else because I thrive on routine and schedule, yet I'm incapable of doing that myself. But then I realized yeah. that's just because I was friggin' exhausted all the time from doing this soul sucking work mm-hmm. and, um, you know, not asking for help, not knowing how to ask for help and not doing anything that made my soul happy. So of course, I'm just kind of passing the buck whenever I can. But I found like now that I'm doing what I love, I, I, sometimes I can borderline be a little bit of a workaholic where I'm down here and I'm like, oh my God, I haven't eaten dinner yet. I haven't fed the kids yet, you know? (laughs) Um, So yeah, it's all about balance, but I kind of give you that story wondering if you relate to it at all. Um, Yes. I think that's one of the reasons we connected as well, because I I had my diagnosis a few years ago and that's one of the reasons I'm inspired by you because I see you showing up consistently and it sort of grounds me in the story of, of, um, how with ADHD people, we, we think that we're not consistent. And then you get the yeah. message from all the entrepreneurs saying like success is based on how consistent you are. And so if you're, if you have ADHD, then you're given this message that you will never ever be successful because you can't do that yeah. one basic thing, right. but you show up consistently and that really inspires me. Thank and you. With my journey with it, like when I first started, when I first got diagnosed, nobody believed me, which is interesting. Uh-huh. They all like, oh, you're fine. We like you the way you are. Don't take any medication. You'll change. And mm-hmm. it was really lonely at the time. But mm-hmm. and someone told me to not talk about it. They said, like, people won't understand. Don't talk about it. But I knew I knew right in my heart that that was wrong. So I started yeah. posting about it online. And, you know, it didn't really get a lot of um, response, but in the years that followed, people have come up to me and said, like, you changed my life by talking about it. So because it led them to like learn a little bit about it and go on their own journeys of discoveries and amplify everything that way. So for me, like sometimes the fear that you have, you can know something and be scared and move forward and it's still the right move. Oh, I want to quote you on that. You can know something and be scared and it still end up being the right thing that's a good one don't ask me to repeat it because it's going out of my memory (laughs) you can know something and be scared and still have it be the right thing I think that's powerful um yeah you know like one of my main like little mantras from my spirit guides is do it scared Mm -hmm. So for years, I had a post-it note beside me on the wall, do it scared, like, Mm -hmm. you know, fear and excitement. This is an interesting thought. This is something that my guides have kind of brought to me before. Um, Fear and excitement, if you really think about it, have very similar physical sensation qualities. Yes. So they feel the same to us in our physical body. It's just the way that we mentally compartmentalize those two things in two very different ways. But my guides have kind of said, like, could fear just be excitement, but you don't know how it's going to turn out? Like, maybe that's (laughs) all it is. And I'm like, so I look at things a little bit different. I look at fear a little bit different. And, And this, like, is really kind of validated even more so because when I do higher self readings, um, one of the questions that I ask, I ask like five questions to everyone's higher self when I do this type of reading. And one of the questions is what are 
you know, this client's fears, limitations, and challenges. And those mm-hmm. aren't bad things. Those are things that you, like the, the mountains you came here to climb is what I'll say, like the things that you're here to do, that you're mm-hmm. here to overcome that resistance and fear. And then like the magic is just on the other side, right? Like there's a gift in it. So if, if you know, we can kind of start thinking about fear and excitement and sitting with that and like, hmm, you know, am I, am I just like resisting something that I really, really need to grow and evolve? Yes, it's like trusting, trusting that uh, if you're called to do it, then it's important and not necessarily needing that instant yes. gratification of every, everybody patting you on the back. And, that's you know, right. sometimes you'll, sometimes you'll never know the impact that you have. That's, that's what I was thinking when you were talking about posting things, because I had a similar experience where I, I post things all the time about ADHD and different things like that. And um, you don't know who's watching. You don't know who's listening. You don't know who you're impacting. Um, but and just, no, and I, just, I don't own their story. Like I don't have right. any, like, I don't have any right to know their story. Right. But the fact that I spoke up, I feel glad that I did. I felt glad that I listened to what I felt was important to do, even though at the time, like, like you don't talk about like possibly not having a perfect brain. Like, right. That was a very unsafe thing to do at the time. I agree. Nobody did that, right? Nobody like showed any weakness or vulnerability. Especially in business, you know, that's mm-hmm. something that I consciously and intentionally do in my business. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I hear a lot of feedback about, actually. Like, you talk about things that other people don't want to talk about. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you listened to the episode um, that I did where I talked about how I did, like, readings. I did these, like, gifted readings for community members. And then someone asked me a question. And I literally fell apart. And I was, like, sobbing uncontrollably. And I couldn't mm. stop crying. They asked me a question about my grandmother. And I was still processing a lot of stuff. And I had so much resistance and so much shame in the moment because I'm like, I'm here as their mentor. They're looking up to me and I can't keep it together, right? But I knew this was my ego, right? Mm -hmm. This was resistance. But in fact, that brought that community so much closer because I was able to show them that like, yeah, you can be be seen as a mentor or someone to kind of take a guidance from and still be real. In fact, maybe that makes you more relatable and um, more valid in some way, right? Like we have to show all parts of ourselves. And so I'm, this podcast really has been for me, like the reason I started it other than I want to help people is I want to heal this voice within myself that says, nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit. Who do you think you are? Right? Like, why are you talking about this stuff? Nobody's going to respect you. If you tell everybody you have ADHD or you're angry and you're (laughs) grieving, but actually it's what brings community together because universally whether we have ADHD or something else or we're struggling in a different way everyone has something that makes them feel isolated or alienated or different yes and I I feel that that's so important that um but the more you talk about it the more the shame has nowhere to hide absolutely because a lot of people are masking who they are because they don't feel safe because if they feel if they show up as they are they're going to be rejected or they're going to be excluded or lose credibility that's right and i really feel like there's credibility a shift is starting to happen you're right and and sometimes you have to be the one who's willing to like step out and risk the loss of credibility to in order Mm -hmm. to connect that's right Oh, I love this. I'm having like some aha moments uh, through this conversation. And, you know, I'm someone that processes by speaking. I don't know about you, but I need to talk out loud. Um, and that that's also something that's really interesting. Like when you have ADHD, often you've been told you're too much, like you talk uh-huh. too much, you overshare too much, you're too sensitive, you're too... And so you you end up building all these walls and these layers that, you know, once you reach our age, you you're actively trying to peel them back and heal them. Yeah. And it's a a long process. Yeah. For years, you're too much, you overshare, you say too much, you know, um, 
and now I'm like, so, so to create a podcast, that's, you know, a, a lot, like it's like 50% guests, 50% me, right? My story. It's like, well, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk and I'm going to be too much and I'm going to overshare and gosh, darn it. You're going to love me for it. And, and people <laughs> do though. So it's like, I think it's true. Like you can never be too much or too mm-hmm. little for the right people. Like, yes, you it's a good never... filter. You know, be yourself, be too much, and the ones who can't cope will, you know, find the oh, find their oh, way out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I love this so much. Um, let's end with like being in our heads too much. So we've talked about this like busy minds and maybe overthinking sometimes, overanalyzing, maybe being worried and like keeping holding mm-hmm. ourselves back from things. I'm a seeker and a learner. You are too. We've talked mm-hmm. about this. I am constantly, um, you know, learning is part of a part of me. I'm a, I'm a five a one emotional like... generator. <laughs> it's a passion. I literally am here to do it. It's in my human design. Like I'm here mm-hmm. to learn and research and get to the bottom of things. But there comes a time when spirit is like, okay, Amy, you know enough about this thing stop reading about it, stop buying books about it and do something about it. I see, I think you see this a lot in the spiritual world. It's like, okay, what course can I take next? What masterclass can I take next? What book can I, what podcast can I listen to next? Do all those things certainly, but like, don't forget to integrate it without putting you on the spot too much. What does integration mean to you? Like how, or like, I guess integration for me is like initiating or taking action with something. So I think I'm very guilty of what you're talking about. Um, I, I have a good connection to my, my sister in <laughs> Scotland and pretty much every day she tells me to stop overthinking. <laughs> yeah. Stop overthinking mm-hmm. it. So maybe yeah. that's one of my techniques is to have a support system of instead yeah. of being on my own and like you go to these thought spirals and you sort of ruminate over and over. And if you can talk to your trusted people, they will quickly call you out yeah. on that. Yeah. And then there's like other things I do is, um, I think we talked about this as well, is accepting your own rhythm for the day. It's like, yes. know when you get the most of work done. Like I used to beat myself something fierce about how I can't start any kind of cerebral work until like 10 a.m. Before that, mm-hmm. I want to connect. I want to reach out to people, chat, um, go on social yeah. media. And uh, so I would tell myself, oh, no, if you were dedicated to your business, you'd be up at 7am doing work. But I've never been able to follow that routine. I always go back into the natural flow. So instead, I recreated my day to take advantage of when my I naturally wanted to do things. So that's yeah. one way I do it. That's amazing. I hear people talking about that too. Like I, me personally, I don't start work. Like I don't sit down to record podcasts or even have clients being able to book themselves in before 1030 Mm AM, partly because, you know, getting kids off to school and doing all Mm -hmm. those things, but also because that's my natural rhythm Mm -hmm. too as well. Um, So I, I love that you're sharing that. I think that's very, very important. Your natural rhythm, especially if you have a little bit of choice or flexibility within your day and your routine. I also uh, set myself deadlines. Like if I have a deadline Mm. on a project, I am far more likely to um, stop procrastinating. (laughs) I'll never stop procrastinating because I think that's part of how my brain is wired. If something's too boring or too complex or too stressful, I will procrastinate until I hit that point where I can, you know, get yeah. that dopamine and, and get on with it. So I have to artificially yeah. create those situations that create that that tipping point. I do that too. That's mm-hmm. a great point. Yeah. Okay. You're full of really good ideas. <laughs> well, I amazing. have to keep changing the tips as well because my brain mm-hmm. likes novelty. So I can't just pick one method and then stick with that. I have to keep rotating and finding new methods and this is the best new idea. I'm going to go with this and be okay with myself doing that. Give myself permission to have consistency in the sense that I will always keep finding new ways to um, organize myself and always find new ways to motivate myself. That is a consistency in itself. That's the consistency. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is, this is really good. I really, I think that a lot of people are going to take a lot from that. And, you know, those are, definitely ways to integrate and take action and kind of create that like inner motivational um, 
system, but also it's very aligned and unique for your yourself. I think that's great. Um, integration for me is also, you know, it's very similar. It's in like taking action. I know some people, integrations can sometimes be with just like slowing down, slowing down. Like yesterday, for instance, I shared in my Instagram stories that I had t- kind of taken a time out. So for 30 minutes, I'm like, everybody leave me alone. I'm going to just lay on the, you know, we have like outdoor furniture. I'm like, just inter- I'm integrating. I'm in integration mode. <laughs> like sometimes it's just about stopping for a moment and allowing yourself to rest and to mm. take a moment to process what the heck you're learning. Um, Cause I don't know about you, but I'm always like on fast mode in my mind. So my yes. mind's always like looking for new things to learn. Um, But it's also like sometimes in the sense of integrating through um, rest and slowing down, I try to listen to myself. And if I have feeling low energy, then I will in the middle of the day, go and lay down, go put a meditation and lay down, maybe take a bath. And Mm -hmm. I find I'm way more productive after if I do that instead of just pushing through. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you find that you're someone that... um can really feel grounded or integrate, maybe like getting outside in nature might be part of your integration at times. Ideally. Yeah, me too. In my my imagination, I'm a very big nature person. (laughs) And I do actually, I I have these two rocks and a willow tree at the bottom of my bottom of my yard Mm -hmm. that I sometimes go out and sit down when I have to think about things or if I'm nervous about something or just to have Mm -hmm. a cup of tea out there. Do I go for big walks? Um, in my head, I do. <laughs> Getting around to it, no. <laughs> yeah, I think this is one of those things where it's it's a personal thing, right? Like when I say nature, I don't I don't mean you have to be hiking or walking. Um, I like the idea could, of it. <laughs> right. It could just be about sitting outside. Like for me, yeah, sometimes it's about going for a walk on the trail, but sometimes mm-hmm. it's just about laying on my my porch furniture, <laughs> right? Listening to the birds and just telling everybody to go away for a little bit. Like it can be, I think it's interesting because – I heard you say like, yeah, sometimes I go outside and I have a cup of tea under the willow tree, but it was almost like part of you was like, but I don't go for walks, you know, like it's almost like there's some sort of limitation. Yeah, I feel like I'm telling myself off there. (laughs) Like I'm I'm like, I should go on more walks. Right. That kind of judgment. Yeah. No, but this, but I think that's important because I think that's like, I think a a lot of people don't walk around and kind of think about things that way or have that awareness pop in, like, not to say a lot of people don't, but like, I don't know if, I I don't know if everybody processes like I do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I notice, especially the more that I'm opening up spiritually, I can, I notice when, when things aren't aligned or when I say something and I'm like, wait a second, like, why did I say that? Like for the first six months of having this podcast, There was a word I used in my intro. It's since been taken out and been changed. But there was a word that was used in my intro and it said it was just. So Mm -hmm. I said, up until five years ago, I was just your average mom and wife or no, uh, average wife and mom of three or something like that. Okay, a minimizing word. I was minimizing and I didn't notice and I didn't notice. And then one day I was like, it was like aggravating me it was like a pebble in your shoe and I was like oh my god what am I doing why did I minimize myself I'm not just anything and then in that like in those days of thinking about that before I took action and changed it and re-recorded it I had three or four people message me I I, I hesitated to say this because I didn't want to like step on any toes but like I have to say you're not just anything you should really take that word out of there and I was like oh my god you know like the universe speaks but um I think it's good to call ourselves out sometime and it's like I think that's part of the growth and the evolution on this journey it's like not always sunshine and roses on the spiritual path right it's like well, then if you call it out you can find out like what's the awareness around like like why am I saying that to myself and then you right. can like you know yeah why isn't it? sitting outside under the willow tree a uh, being connected to nature it is to me I'm like well that's you being connected to nature right so it's just about I think the the awareness is a gift because then you can do something with that if you want or you can begin to shift that mindset so I I think that that happened purposely and I kind of like it I hope that hope you don't mind that I I I called you out there um I think that you already had the you already had the awareness you're like oh why did I say that uh yeah I'm I feel like deeply connected outside too but it's one of those things that I have to really intentionally do like 
I have to go, okay, I'm really ungrounded and I have to kind of like suffer in the feelings of ungroundedness for me to go, okay, I'm just going to go like lay in the grass. Mm. It has to become almost like extremely uncomfortable. And I don't know why. It's not to say I don't like the outdoors. It's just kind of like knowing what you need to do and sometimes it being the last thing that you do. It's, yeah, it's like, it's like you rebel against it. You know, I'm I should rebelling. do that. So I'm going to fight against I'm it. I'm not doing that. Like my daughter will say, well, I was going to unload the dishwasher, but now you ask me. So I don't want to anymore. And I'm like, girl, like I totally understand what you mean, but you still have to unload the dishwasher. And sometimes it's just, you don't want to stop what you're doing. You just, you, you, you're right. in the flow That's with something. More of it. And like, That's more of it. you know, mm-hmm. people who are more linear thinkers, they like their routines and this, I do this that now, then I do this, then I do this. But I start the first thing and then I don't want to stop it. I just want to keep doing that for the rest Me of the day. Me too. Are you surrounded by linear thinkers? Um, there's a couple of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My and they're good because they provide linear. the structure in my household. So yes, my, my spouse and my mm. oldest child are the linear thinkers. And so they like that. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm just, sometimes I rebel against that, yes. but I also see how I need that. Mm-hmm. Like I can see this, this union we're coming together, even though we're very different to teach each other different things. I think I'm here to help him let loose and surrender and explore. And he's like, he always goes, he always jokes around and says, I'm here to keep you alive because if, if I wasn't here, I can't tell you how clumsy I am or how many times I've burned myself on the stove. It's like just ridiculous yeah. things. There's probably some, I think that might be a, a neurodivergent uh, I think thing sometimes, be... but like he just jokes around with me. He's like, I'm here to keep you alive. <laughs> no, I'm laughing because this happens to us all the time. It's like, I had this exact same conversation with my husband yesterday, the one that you're just talking about. So it often yeah. happens that we uh, <laughs> yeah. have synergies like that. Yeah. Yeah. I see it a lot. I see it a lot. And I see very often like a very uh, like, and this is not to say always, but I see it often where there's a very spiritual, intuitive woman and then a very like logical, um, n- not type A in a bad way, but like, you know what I mean? Somebody who's more routine um, spouse. I see that so often. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting how that how that happens and works out. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's opposites. It's more like complementary. Like you said, it's yeah. like we, we both bring different things to the relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything before we go? This has honestly been a delight. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Um, I definitely have taken some wisdom nuggets out of this conversation. And I'd just like to give you the opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to share about yourself or anything upcoming that you'd like to talk about um, within your business? Um, or... With my business, I'm just, um, I make journals and uh, I design my own journals. I put my art on the covers and I mm-hmm. sell them online on Amazon. And I also do, I do portraiture, animals and family portraitures, but I also do magical art as well. So um, I'm sure Amy will give you my website if you're interested yeah. in taking a look at what I do. Yeah, I'll link it all in the show notes, I definitely feel like at some point in the future, I will be reaching out for some magical realism art of, I don't know, the, my family or myself or a pet. I don't know. But absolutely, I think that is in store for us in the future. That Thanks so fun. much. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Rebecca. It's You're a delight, honestly. Um, lovely to chat to you. Thanks, Thanks so much. for having me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll see you again next week. If you have enjoyed this episode, please consider hopping on over to wherever you listen to your podcast and giving it a five star review. Thank you so much in advance. If you'd like to keep in touch, please head over to my website, theintuitiverising.com to keep up with all the things that I have been doing. I also have a private Facebook community for people just like you. It's called the Intuitive Rising Community. All you got to do is request to join and I will let you in. Keep rising.